and snow, welcome. <laughs> and for all of you that are watching from home, we're happy you're here with us too. We're going to stand together this morning and we're going to lift up the name of Jesus and sing in praises. Let's sing together. Angels from the realms of glory, bring your flight over.
before Dan's going to come up. Uh, if you saw the email that went out this week, you'll know that we are going to be going remote for our Christmas Eve services this year. And while that's a little sad, and I think all of us wish that we could be in person, we also think it's the right choice for this year. But something that we want to do to kind of make it a little more homey, a little more family, is for you to make a video at home to send in to us. So the details are in the email that was sent out. They're also in your bulletin today. So what you'll need to do is get candles. We're going to have candles at the end of service that you can pick up, or you can use candles at your house. It doesn't matter. At the end of service, we normally light candles, and we sing a couple of carols. So what's going to happen is you're going to take these candles, you're going to bring them home, and you're going to make a little video. I have already sent out a track that you can sing along with so that your track matches what our track is. <laughs> Um, and you can use those candles, take a video with your family. Like I said, all the details are in the email so that you do it correctly and make sure that you're good to go. But we think it would just be so awesome to be able at the end of the service to be able to see so many of our faces and our families and our homes singing these Christmas carols together with our candles lit. So please get a candle afterwards. And I think I have in there December 15th as the last day to get those videos to me. So you have a couple weeks to get that done, all right? And we really would love it if you could take a few minutes to do that and send that in because I just we all think it would just be such a great moment to feel like we're kind of together and feel like it's kind of family even though we're all apart. Uh, I echo everything she just said. If you, uh, if you remember last year, if you were at our Christmas Eve service, we brought back the candles. I think it had been a little while since we did them here. And it was just, I actually, I got a little teary-eyed during the service last year. And it's always been my favorite part of Christmas Eve. And so, again, in a year where everything is different and we've had to pivot and adjust on so many things, um, this is one, one way that we can still feel like there's something personal uh, to our Christmas Eve service. And I've had a couple of people ask, we made the decision to go remote. This is not something, we haven't got anything from the governor yet saying, hey, you have to have this many people only or anything like that. But we feel like there's a good possibility that may come. And this gives us the best opportunity to do a Christmas Eve service and to do it well, um, where if we decided to go live and then last minute had to pivot and go remote, it would be a little more difficult to put something together. Uh, but if you got the email this week, or you see in your bulletin this, uh, this week as well, um, we are also going to go remote the next two Sundays after Christmas Eve. So you're talking about the 27th, I believe, and the 3rd of January. And again, this is just, this is just out of caution. Um, we know that people will be traveling during Christmas. We know that family will be coming here for Christmas. And, and there's so many different guidelines and how long you're supposed to stay away from people. And, how, and so we're just going to take those two weeks and we're going to go remote for those two weeks. But another big reason, honestly, is our worship team, our sound volunteers, our video volunteers, we have been working them really hard since June. Um, and so this is an opportunity that we have, too, just to give them a couple weeks to breathe <laughs> and just rest. And so, again, we will be going remote for Christmas Eve and then those two Sundays uh, immediately following Christmas Eve. And please grab candles. I know... Some of you may not like the idea of singing. Um, I don't care, honestly. I don't care if your family mouths along with it. That's fine. If you're, if you're worried about that, mouth it, but just get us the video so that we can put all that together uh, for our, our Christmas Eve program. Um, I don't think there's really anything else that needs to, be, uh, needs to be announced. Make sure you read through your bulletin. There's a couple uh, volunteer opportunities in there. Uh, but would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, just the opportunity to be gathered together. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for safety. Um, we thank you that uh, what we got last night in terms of, of this storm was, uh, was not as bad as it was predicted to be. Lord, we thank you for uh, just the opportunity to celebrate the Christmas season together. And Lord, now as we continue to worship, as we continue uh, to sing together, as we open up your word together, Lord, we ask that you would move in a mighty way in this place. We pray that your spirit would come heavy upon this place. And Lord, I pray that we would be able to set aside all of the distractions, all the things that are going on around us, all of the, the busyness of life, and simply focus on the gift of the Messiah. The boy, the child who came to save. 
And Lord, we thank you for that gift. So Lord, we pray that you will continue to move in this service in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, we're the Dalzells. I'm Jeff. This is Megan, and this is Levi. And we're going to do the Advent <laughs> candle today. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. Last week we lit the candle of hope, and today we light the candle of love. All of these other candles are about what Christmas brings. Hope, joy, and peace are the results of, in our lives of the birth of the Messiah. Love is different. While love is also <laughs> a result of what Jesus brings, it stands alone as the motivation for Christmas. Love is the reason that Christmas exists. It was the love of God for us that sent his son to earth. We have Emmanuel, God with us, because of God's love. The Bible reveals the motivation behind Christmas in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The Messiah was love, showed love, taught love, and lived love. Jesus gave himself willingly on the cross because of love. As we find hope, joy, and peace in that loving relationship with God and Christ, that love is to overflow from us to the world that we live in. God loved us and calls us to love others. This Christmas season... Take the time to reach out in love to those around you. Take the time to model God's love to those who don't know him and to be a reflection of who he is. As you love others, may God's love abound in you. This is our prayer from Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. Today we have a new, newer Christmas song to teach you all. And while those old hymns and old carols are wonderful and I love that we know them and can sing them along together. There's something about a new song that just puts a new spark in your heart. And so this morning we're going to learn this, this song together. It's called Behold Him. And as we sing this together, this is such a wonderful song of worship and focusing our minds and our hearts on God and on Jesus this Christmas season. So if you know it, sing along. If you don't, when you feel comfortable, you can sing along with us. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be.
I've been reminded several times already this morning that uh, last week I wished for snow. And uh, just for the record, I don't mind it. I like the snow, but not the, like this was the big, heavy, ugly. This wasn't the pretty Christmas winter snow. So hopefully by next week, there'll be two feet of pretty Christmas winter snow on the ground. Uh, that's, that's what we're hoping for. But it does, it does make me laugh. And I remember in Foxborough, it was the same thing because New Englanders, uh, you know, not being a New Englander, you move to New England, people, oh, we're hardy people. You know, you, this is a little bit of snow, and there's like, look, we even gave you an extra hour and a half to get ready for the service, and <laughs> it's about half the regular attendance. So, so welcome to all you hardy New Englanders that are watching from home. Uh, we're, we're glad you're here with us. This, uh, this last Tuesday, we had our, our, our annual meeting here at the church, and I was looking forward to this meeting. I was excited. I was a little bit nervous because I, uh, I haven't gone through an annual meeting with, with this church before. And, and I know that anytime you talk about money and uh, electing people to leadership positions and things like that, there's potential for things to get a little bit chippy at times. And so, you know, I knew you guys weren't going to do that. I knew that. But uh, I was praying for weeks ahead of time just that there would really be a spirit of unity as we had this meeting together. And, and the meeting went wonderfully. Uh, we did pass the budget. We did um, put three new elders into place. And um, it's, it was exciting. But one of the things that I really appreciated was uh, the questions that people had. People asked great questions. And so many of them, and I love the heart behind them, but so many of them came back for, to what's the vision? Where are we going? You know what, we see, these, we see all these numbers in front of us, and, and a budget ought to reflect where the church is going. A budget ought to reflect what the purpose of the church is and what the vision of the church is. And so I loved those kind of questions. And, and unfortunately, I had to stand up and answer them, a, a lot of them, as, well, you know what, we don't quite know yet. We don't know the specifics yet. Um, this has been a crazy year. Uh, the elders have done a wonderful job over the course of the last a uh, couple of years, especially working through a pastoral transition, but they have been more of an administrative board. They've been dealing with more administrative things, and, and really this last year, we haven't had a lot of opportunity to sit and just talk about vision and just to dream about where it is that God wants to take DEC, because I believe with all my heart, God has a plan for this church, absolutely, and God has a way that he is going to grow his kingdom through us here in this place, a and I've been praying through it, and I've been dreaming about some things, and, and I've got some things I'd love to share with you, but I haven't had a chance to share them with the elders yet, and I don't want them to be sitting here going, wait a minute, what? We're, I don't want to surprise my elders with anything, and so we've got guys now, three new guys coming on, Tim Hafner, uh, Josh Evans, and Paul Sabrilli, who my, my belief, getting to know them over this last year, is that these are guys that want to talk vision. Um, along with the three that are on the on the board from uh, that are carryovers from uh, from the previous board, they want to talk vision. They want to they want to serve in more of a shepherding role and take really the rightful place of an elder as the spiritual overseer of the church. And so I'm I'm very very excited about where it is that we're going to go. I love to dream and I love to dream big. And I think I think God's going to do some incredible things here over the course of the next couple years. Uh, we will we will have a vision Sunday. Um, I don't know when yet, because again, I have to, I got to talk to my elders and clear some stuff with them first, but sometime in the middle of January, early February, we'll have a Vision Sunday where you'll begin to get some of the details of where it is that I believe God is taking um, the DEC, and I hope you'll get excited as well. Uh, but the, the dreaming part and the, the talking vision amongst leadership part is just, it's just a small piece of things, because if God gives you a vision, you've got to be able to communicate it to people. At some point, as God begins to reveal where it is he's taking us as a church, 
I would hope that every single one of you that's here would be able to say, this is who we are. This is who God's called us to be. This is where we're, we're going as a church. We've got to be able to communicate it. Long-range thinking, long-range planning really is pointless if you don't communicate. And what we started to look at last week, I think, is the best example of vision planning and vision communicating that you will ever see. They say that if you want people to grab onto something, you need to start to communicate at least two months ahead of time. Well, the event that took place on that first Christmas morning, God began to communicate to that people centuries beforehand. God began to give clues and God began to give prophecies about who this Messiah would be and what things would look like and where he would be born so that no one would miss this absolutely incredible event. On that quiet night in Bethlehem, when God became a man. When he left heaven, when he left his throne, and he came down to be born in a stable, to become one of us. This is the event that God didn't want anyone to miss. And we looked last week when the baby was born, that it was trumpeted uh, to the shepherds, and the shepherds went, and the shepherds worshipped. God wanted people to understand this momentous occasion. And so he used the prophets to tell the people that his son was coming. Over 2,500 years ago, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words, which we're going to be spending the next few weeks in. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I, Isaiah gives us this clear picture of who the Messiah would be. And he gives us this, this look at what the child would provide for all people. The baby would be known by many different names. Last week we looked at the fact that the angel appeared to Joseph and said, you're going to call him Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. That name is the core of what he came to do. He came to save us from our sins. He came to bring us back into a right relationship with God. But scripture also contains all these other names for Jesus, and they all have to do with, with the very personal way that he wants to relate to us. The personal way that he wants to be in relationship with us. And what Isaiah is revealing here is this baby will bring us so much more than salvation. And he gives us these four incredible names for the Messiah. And over the course of the next weeks, we're going to look at each one of these names specifically. And so we're going to start with this morning with that first one. Isaiah says he will be called Wonderful Counselor. I've been to, I've been to counseling a few times in my life. And I remember the first time that I went to counseling, it was right when I entered into ministry. I was 23, 24 years old, a youth pastor. I'd just gone through a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, Aaron and I had just had our first child. Uh, my parents had just divorced. My dad had just been removed from ministry after 30 years of ministry. It was a lot of stuff going on. And, and I remember we, we started working at this church, and the elders came to me and said, look, we just want to make sure you're okay. We want you to go and, and talk to somebody. And I remember my first thought, it was not, okay, that sounds great. My first thought was, I don't need a shrink. I was raised in a way where, look, if you had problems, you figured out the problems, and you dealt with the problems. And all I could picture was myself laying on this couch, you know, with tears coming down my face, talking about my childhood, and some complete stranger writing notes and asking me how that made me feel. And I had absolutely no desire to do that. But I ended up, they, they persisted, and I ended up going, and it was great. It was absolutely beneficial. But I remember there were some questions that I had before I went to see this guy they wanted me to see. There were some things that I wanted to know. If I was going to have a counselor, if I was going to go to a counselor, there's some things I wanted settled in my mind. And I think those are the same questions that we have today about Jesus. If we're going to look at him as our wonderful counselor, I think there's some things that we need to understand. The first question I had was, well, what kind of counselor is he? Because nowadays you've got psychiatrists, you've got psychologists, you've got people with certificates, people with masters, people with doctorates, you've got those who follow Freud, those who follow Jung, you've got guidance counselors, career counselors, job counselors, marriage counselors, you've got all these different kinds of counselors, and I want to know, who is this guy? If I'm going to trust someone, if I'm going to open up my inner child with someone, 
I want to know who they are. I want to know what type of counselor they are. And really, in human terms, there is no Swiss Army knife kind of counselor that can take care of everything, every issue, every problem. But by the language that Isaiah uses, he's revealing to the people that that's exactly what Jesus would be. That Jesus was going to be the kind of counselor that could take care of any need, any issue, any problem. Jesus was going to be enough. And he tells us what kind of counselor he's going to be. He says he will be wonderful. He simplifies it for us. Look, he's going to be wonderful. And the issue for us is neither of these words necessarily translate into our language today or our line of thinking today. For us, we hear the word wonderful and we think it's just it's far above normal or far above average, but we throw that word around all the time. But the word that Isaiah used for wonderful was the Hebrew word pele. And the word is found 13 times in Old Testament writings. And every single time it's used, it's used in connection with God. This is God's own personal word. And so the Israelites that were reading this in its original language would have looked at that wonderful part and immediately knew this is God. It had to do with God directly or it had to do with the miraculous divine works that only God could do. And so they would have read this and where we just read wonderful, they would have seen divine. Because again, we, we throw wonderful out all the time. We, I had pizza the other night. It was wonderful. The Browns are eight and three. That's wonderful. Well, we were, I was going to take a swipe at the Patriots, but I'll leave that one alone. But in this context, it's too easy this year. It's no fun. In this context, it literally means miraculously extraordinary. It means far above what you would think is possible. So the Browns record might actually still fit with this definition. But where we read wonderful, Isaiah is saying this is a counselor who will be far above anything that you could conceive or imagine. This is a miraculous, divine counselor who is fully capable of producing the miraculous, of producing divine results. This is God. And then we have that word counselor. And again, we hear this word, we think of, of professional counselors. We think of those you know, sitting in a big overstuffed leather chair with their notebook, nodding every once in a while and taking notes as, as you pour out your heart to them. That's not what a counselor was back in the Old Testament days. A counselor was someone that you had a deep relationship with. A counselor was someone that you trusted and you respected. They had a proven track record of relationship with you. They had the authority to speak into your life. They had the relationship with you where they could speak truth into your life. In those days, the counselor, your counselor, was someone that you couldn't live without. And so as we look at this word or this name, as it would have been read 2,500 years ago, the Israelites would have seen this as the miraculous, divine God who wants to be intimately involved in their lives, who could be trusted, who, who wants to move them in a way that would be best for them. He's our wonderful counselor. Now, the second thing I remember wondering about this guy that I was going to go see, I want to know what kind of counselor he was. I also want to know what are his qualifications. You, know, you don't want to go to someone who, who spent $5 online and got a certificate in general counseling of the world. You know, that's, that's not who you want to go to. You want to make sure there's qualifications. They've been trained to do what you need them to do. And as we look at the Messiah, there are qualifications that he has that no other counselor could have. The, the first is wisdom. Now, when we go to an earthly counselor, we want a guy that's wise. That, that is something I think all of us are looking for. You want someone that at least seems wise. But even the best counselors, oh, who's a, Dr. Phil? I don't know. I'm very limited on my big name counselors. But as you look at, okay, look at Dr. Phil on TV as he's giving advice to someone. You can sit back and go, well, that sounds wise. But really, he's guessing. He doesn't know the end from the beginning like God does. And so Jesus has a wisdom that is far above anything that we can find in this world. In fact, we're told a little earlier in Isaiah, Isaiah wrote this about the coming Messiah. 
A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, talking about the line that Jesus would be born in. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He can be our wonderful counselor because he is all wise. And that wisdom comes from, this is not just him guessing. This is not just him looking at things and taking his best guess at how things are going to turn out. He knows. He can see the end. We took a family vacation to Canada years ago. It's the last time we'll ever go to Canada, but that's another story for another day. We took a vacation when Ethan and Katie were just little, so we just had the two older kids at that point. And we visited some botanical garden. You could guess whose idea that was. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't mine. But as we're walking through this garden, I remember there's a stone path. And I could see up above, I don't remember if it was sunflowers or what it was, but I could see up above it to see that this stone path curved around a little bit and then ran right into a fence. It, it didn't go anywhere. But my daughter was probably five or six at the time, and she desperately wanted to go explore what was down that path. And as she walked, I just remember looking at her and watching her walk and knowing that she was going to walk right around the corner into a wall. And the look of disappointment on her face. I tried to tell her it wasn't worth it. She didn't listen to me. But the bottom line is I could see she couldn't. That's the kind of counselor that God is. That's the kind of counselor this Messiah is for us. He can see. He can see where that road goes. He can see the end. And he can give us that wisdom that comes from knowing. You want perfect counsel? This is the only place to get it. The second qualification is that he knows you. When I was a youth pastor, I did a lot of counseling. And a lot of times, kids would come in with issues that were, frankly, far above my pay grade. And I remember talking with parents and saying, look, your kid needs to go talk to someone that can help. Your kid needs to go talk to a, a professional. And almost every time, the parents would say, they don't want to. They want to talk to you. Why? Because they know you. And you know them. It's hard to sit down with a stranger sometimes and to share from those deep places of our lives. But with Jesus, you'll never find a counselor who knows you better because he made you. He created you. Earthly counselors might know people to a degree. Earthly counselors have studied people. But our wonderful counselor makes people. That's a much different qualification. Look, listen to what he tells the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And in the Psalms, you have the beautiful language of David as he talks about being fearfully and wonderfully made, as he talks about God knowing him to the degree that he knit him together in his mother's womb. This is not the picture of a creator that just snaps his fingers or waves a magic wand. This is the picture of a creator that gets his hands dirty in the act of creating. This counselor knows you. This counselor takes pride in his work. You read throughout, throughout all of Scripture that he rejoices in the final product. There's not any of us that are a mistake. There's not any part of us that are a mistake. We are the work of his hand. And we can have this as our counselor, our confidant, our advocate, the one who knows us best because he's the very one that created us. The third qualification that he has that sets him apart from any other counselor that we could know is the fact that he's been there. He's been there. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what these prophecies of the Messiah are all about. This is the flesh, or the word becoming flesh. This is God coming to earth to walk this earth, to experience the things that we experience. I remember the first time a teenager came into my office and sat across from me and told me that their parents were getting divorced. I remember standing up, walking to the other side of my desk, hugging this teenager and sobbing with this teenager. Why? Because less than a year before that, my parents got divorced. I knew the pain they were feeling. I knew the emotions they were feeling. I know the stupid thoughts that were going through their head trying to figure out what they could have done differently to, to make things work and to make their parents stay together and to make their parents 
keep loving each other. The way that I dealt with them and the way that I related to them was completely different because I understood, because I'd gone through it. Scripture tells us that Jesus is our wonderful counselor because he's walked in our shoes. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And then a little earlier in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, talking about Jesus, talking about this wonderful counselor, says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus can help. Jesus is our wonderful counselor because he understands, because he's experienced it, because he's been there. Have you ever been betrayed? He has. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? He has. Have people ever gossiped about you? Have you ever suffered physical pain, physical loss, had a physical need? Have you felt lonely? Have you been afraid? Jesus has experienced all of these things. He's been there. Again, John says the word became flesh. He became human. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He can relate to whatever experience we have in life. This is an incredible quality to have in a counselor. And the last qualification, not only did he create you, but he loves you. He loves you. Look, for most of us, where's the first place that we're going to turn for counsel? The first place we're going to turn for counsel is someone that we know loves us. Someone that we know has our best interest at heart. I'm going to go talk to my wife first, or I'm going to go talk to my mom, or I'm going to go talk to my dad for someone that loves you. You don't have to worry about a hidden agenda. You don't have to worry about it, well, it's just their job. They're just punching the clock until your hour's up and you get out of there. In this wonderful counselor, we have someone that loves us. Someone that wants what's best. Paul talked about the scope of this love in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The love that this counselor has for each and every one of us, Scripture tells us it really goes to the lengths that we can't truly understand, that we never will understand. He loves us completely. He loves us unconditionally. It was love that drove him from the manger to the cross where he accomplished what he'd been born to do to save us from our sin. This counselor is well qualified because you're never going to find another one that loves you like he does. And the last question I had before I went into counseling for the first time, I want to know what kind of counselor he was. I want to know what his qualifications were. But I also want to know what the benefits are. You know, it's kind of that, I think it's human nature. Well, what's, what's in it for me? What can I expect? If I go lay everything out for this complete stranger, what can I hope to gain? What are the changes it's going to make in my life? The benefits that the wonderful counselor provides for us. The first one, and again, this goes back to his qualifications. This goes back to the wisdom. But he's able to provide direction. He's able to provide for direction. All throughout Scripture, you have the promise that God will lead us. You have the promise that in a relationship with Christ, he, he will take us in the direction that he longs for us to go and wants for us to go and, and literally has set out before us since before the beginning of time. Do you remember way back in the dark ages when headphones had cords? Can anyone remember way back then? Corded headphones, especially those little earbuds, they had this incredible magic power where you could take them out, stick them in your pocket for two seconds, pull them back out, and they would be in such a tangled mess that you could never get them undone. I, I literally have thrown out I don't know how many pairs of earbuds because there was just no way they were ever going to get untangled again. Some of us feel that way with life, whether it's the natural consequences of decisions that we've made or we're struggling with things that are not of our doing. 
life can take some crazy twists and turns and leave us feeling like the path ahead of us is so twisted and so tangled that we can't see a way out. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. The King James says he'll direct our paths. The NIV says he'll make our path straight. It's literally the idea that he will take this twisted mess that we can make of our lives, and he will straighten it out so we can walk in a way that honors him and glorifies him. If we trust in him, we're told he'll provide direction in our lives. The second benefit is you have the promise that this wonderful counselor will not only direct us and lead us, but this wonderful counselor will carry your burdens for you. I think when you go to counseling, one of the things that is so freeing is just talking about things. For so many of us, we don't have a simple outlet where we can just kind of unload, where we can vent, we can get some things off of our chest. But there's no human counselor that can take those things from us. There's no human counselor that's going to say, you know what, give those all to me and I'll, I'll carry them for you. But you have the promise of this wonderful counselor that when we cast our cares on him, when we give him our problems, we give him our burdens, that he will carry them and he will replace them with a peace that passes all understanding. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus talking. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares for you. Psalm 55, 22, Cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. He will carry our burdens. And He will replace those burdens with rest and peace. And finally, we have this counselor to be our advocate. He will advocate on our behalf. Job 16, 19. Job says, even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. We have Christ, this wonderful counselor, to be an advocate on our behalf before God the Father. And there's a couple ways he does that. First, we're told in Scripture that he's our advocate when we pray. Paul writes in Romans 8, 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. When we don't know what to say, when we don't know what to pray, Scripture tells us that this wonderful counselor is our advocate, that this wonderful counselor will stand up and will speak on our behalf, that he will intercede, that he will bring our prayers and, and petitions before the throne of the Father for us. Scripture also tells us he's our advocate before the Father when life is done. When this life is through, we read this about this wonderful counselor. In Revelation, it says, All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. When all is said and done, this wonderful counselor will stand before God as our advocate. This wonderful counselor will stand before God and say, Yep, yeah, that one's mine. Yeah, he's mine. Yeah, she's, she's mine. Open up the gates of heaven. Let them and give them all of the rights and privileges, really, that only belong to this wonderful counselor, that through a relationship with him we can all share. That's the benefit of trusting in this counselor. This wonderful counselor is, is different. This wonderful counselor is beyond anything that we can experience here in this life as humans with another human counselor. In a world that's craving good counsel. Just walk through a Barnes and Noble or turn on the radio or TV and you just see people are begging for help, begging for counsel. And human counsel can help. But God's promise on that first Christmas morning to us was that through this child, through this Messiah, that Isaiah trumpeted the coming of hundreds of years beforehand, we could enjoy the very counsel of heaven. This baby came to be our wonderful counselor to give us direction to take away uh, the burdens that we have to be our advocate to stand before the throne of god on our behalf and he's the only one that could ever bear this title 
because he alone has all of the qualifications to be this wonderful counselor. He alone is God in the flesh. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the revelation that you give us in your word. Father, we thank you that as, as we enter into a relationship with Jesus, as we accept the forgiveness of sins that comes only through him, that's just the beginning. As we begin to walk forward, as we begin, we begin to learn, we begin to see all of the benefits that are offered in this relationship. And in these two words, Isaiah gives us so much meaning that we can have a relationship with this wonderful counselor, one who will always exceed all of our expectations, one who will always be more than anything that we could ask or imagine. One who knows us and loves us. One who's wise. One who promises to lead us in the direction that we need to go. Lord, I pray that before we turn to any other avenue of help, we would first seek your counsel. We would first seek your and Lord, again, as we continue through all of the busyness of these next weeks, continue to bring our minds and our thoughts back to the manger. Continue to bring our minds and our thoughts back to this baby that was born to be our wonderful counselor. And Lord, we thank you for him. For it's in his name we pray. you stand with us as we close in song. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is
I know things are weird with COVID, um, but take a minute before you leave this place and just make a connection with someone. Say good morning to someone. Introduce yourself to someone that you haven't met yet. And my encouragement for you this week is to take advantage of this incredible relationship that's offered to you wherein Jesus desires to be your wonderful counselor. I know for some of us, we're carrying a lot of weight into this Christmas season. Give it to Him. Lay it at His feet. And just be willing to worship this Christmas. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.